so my name is Cecily, and um, I work as a business psychologist and coach, but mainly, uh, primarily within uh, startups um, and with founders. So I have the pleasure of working with founders from a very early stage, so kind of sometimes before the pre-seed stage, so sometimes in the angel investor stage, and then up through the Series A stage, and also uh, when they either get uh, bought or do an IPO. And um, what I do is, of course, I help and support them on their journey, but also in regards to performance, how they perform, how they build a team. Uh, yes, I think that's it for me. So I have, as said before, coached more than 200 founders and teams, and um, I um, have my own company called Today, where we uh, focus on fostering mentally healthy and mentally resilient uh, founders and teams. And I partner up with the uh, VCs and funds. And I also work with uh, founders and uh, startup teams individually. Yes. And um, a half a year ago, Tech Barbecue and today we launched quite a big report. One of the most comprehensive reports around mental health and uh, startup uh, founders. And um, what we found out was uh, quite interesting. So it was a collection of kind of uh, 50 academic reports around mental health and founders. And we also did a lot of individual interviews and so on. So it was both quantitative and qualitative data collection. And what we found out was that um, research shows, of course, uh, when we also see the 65%, that uh, entrepreneurship is one of the most stressful jobs out there. And in the sports analogy, it would be an extreme sport. And 72% of entrepreneurs have mental health concerns, and 65% does not succeed due to these human-centric reasons. So it's quite some numbers. And if we look at why is it so hard mentally, but also really funny to build a startup, we have two areas. Uh, that is also described in the report. So we have a structural side, and then we have a psychological side. So on the structural side, we can see that building a startup, and of course structures and psychology are intertwined, yeah? But, um, but in, on the structural side, we can see that um, building a startup is very much working under extreme working conditions if you compare it to many other jobs. So you have a very, very high level of uncertainty. You don't know, you know if you're going to be able to build a team. You don't know if you're going to get able to get VC funding. When you have VC funding, you don't know if you're going to get the next funding round or if you have to say goodbye to your team. Yeah. So I work sometimes with founders that are telling me, you know, Cecily, in six days I have to fire my team because there is no more money. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm out of money and I need to say goodbye to them. So it's this constant uncertainty to work under. And then there is a high complexity, yeah? As a founder, you need to, and as a star in a startup, you need to do things that are quite complex, but also things that you have never done before. And most founders also think, you know, when I reach this point, you know, when I reach this point, you know, when I get Series A and when I build my C-level team, then I know what I'm doing, yeah? But they don't. <laughs> they continue this, you know, of course you get more used to, to, to uh, the funding and uh, what you need to do there, but then it's other problems, it's other uncertainty things that, uh, that are uh, evolving. And then you need to do this under an extreme speed. The second one is, of course, responsibility and pressure towards investors and shareholders. And then, very important, that there is very rarely social support. Um, if we look at uh, corporates, the people in corporates that would sit with some of the same, you could say, financial responsibility as many also early stage founders, that person would be, you know, a quite high up manager or VP in a corporate world. They would have maybe a PA, a leadership team, structures in an organization and so on, and colleagues to spare with, yeah? Or they would have uh, a leader that would say to them, you know, you're doing great. Yeah, most founders are also, you know, when do I know when I'm really doing great? 
yeah, I know when I get my VC funding and my products out, but you know, when am I doing great? Because they have rarely people to spare with, unless of course they have a ver very great board. Yes, any questions to this? I'm just blabbering. No? Yes? Yes? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, I can. Why isn't the responsibility towards uh, family a part of that one out there? Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, I guess if it's a very young uh, co-founder or founder, mm. then there's not much. Mm. But uh, I've seen a, a lot of that go around, that yeah. we have a sense of uh, responsibility mm. to the family. Yes. And thank you for mentioning that. We could definitely put all uh, other responsibilities you have as a human being. Yeah. Uh, so I think the reason why we haven't put it up here, it's because, you know, it's it's responsibility and pressure that are censored around, you know, be, being a founder and the company. But you are absolutely right. And thank you for mentioning that. And then on the psychological side. Being a founder is this emotional roller coaster, yeah? So dealing with these constant ups and downs, yeah? So you also know if you're a founder or have, you know, founded something that also your emotional or mental state can really make a difference in regards to the day. So if you wake up, you had a nice sleep, and even though there are problems, if you're, mental, if you're in a good state mentally, then what you're creating is great. It's going to be a new unicorn. Or as a founder, you can wake up, you know, in a very bad mental state and really feel, you know, this is never going to work. Oh, I'm not, never going to get funding. Oh, the product's not going to work. We're not going to get, you know, the, the user experiences as we want and so on. So, so dealing with this emotional roller coaster and your mental state is really important and hard. And then self-worth, a really, really important, really, really important thing. Um, when you are founder, and that is becoming your startup. And if it fails, your identity fails. And it's a little bit with, with, with people who are passionate about what they do. So it's not only startup founders, it's also artists, musicians, painters, sports people. So high performers or people who are really into what they do, they have to really be, you know, um, um, into what they do, they need to go into the fire in order to create something beautiful, but they need to redraw themselves again in order not to get burned. So it's this constant kind of detachment from your own creation that you need to do that is really, really difficult. And the reason why it's really important to do is that when you become your startup and when you are so attached to your company, when it fails, you fail. When you feel pressure around it, when you get no from investors, you take it personally. Yeah, so I worked with a life science uh, founder. Every time he got a no, he said, oh, Cecily, I'm not good enough. You know, I'm not good enough as a person because my science is not good enough because the investors, you know, said no. No, it has nothing to do about you. You know, it's the investors that are looking at the numbers and maybe it doesn't fit. You know, it has nothing to do with you personally. Yeah, so it's about detaching all the time. That makes a mental resilience creates mental resilience. And then loneliness. So a few people to confess to, a few people who really understand your journey as a founder um, is another point and get support from. Yes. So we know both from the data, I also know from my experience, and many of you I think in here that are doing a startup also can relate to this. So we know these are the conditions when you build a startup. Yeah, so this is what they are dealing or facing. These are the challenges you are facing. At the same time, we know that even though there are many challenges, both on the structural and psychological side and a lot of pressure, we know that as a founder, you need to perform. You need to keep your performance quite high. And this is, 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 a, is a model. It's not only a model, it's a law. It's called the jerks. Dodson Law. I don't know if you know it, but it's a very good, um, it's an empirical, a large empirical study around performance and arousal. And here arousal is, of course, stress. 
So what's it, what it shows is that this line is people that work with complicated tasks as building a startup. So that is a lot of decision making, a lot of complexity, a lot of collaboration, and so on. And this line is people working with simple tasks, repetitive work. And what it shows us is that people who work with a high degree of complexity in their job, their performance rises, but to a certain point, and then it drops performance-wise when they get too stressed. Yeah? Where here, you can have more pressure if you do repetitive work. And what I do in my job, and also with Pre-Seed Ventures, in the circles and in the work uh, we do together, is that we give founders the tools to flatten out this curve. So still, of course, have a lot of pressure, but maybe not feeling the pressure, because they get coping mechanism and tools to build mental resilience. That's what we do together, or I do together with pre Ventures. Any questions? I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do. So, yes? Yes. So, together with pre Ventures, we have these circles uh, where we um, where we have focus on mental health and bu building uh, resilience. So it's a resilience training program, you could say, in a way, flattening out that curve. And the founder circles is uh, curated circles with founders that are on the same stage, more or less. So it's uh, five founders in each circle. And uh, uh, it's in here in Matrigal 1. And it's uh, we meet every time, uh, every month, um, over a period of a year. So it's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer learning group where they get different uh, mental resilience uh, training uh, tools. And what we train in regards to mental resilience is, um, first of all, emotional control. So also when you have this roller coaster. So the ability in order to have emotional control is the, the ability to notice, express, and manage your emotions. So when you notice them, many people are so busy, they don't notice really what they feel. So taking the time to check in, connect, and notice what you feel, express them, and then manage them. And then another part we are working with is managing worries and rumination. A lot of founders wake up 3 o'clock in the night. I don't know why it's 3 o'clock, but many do. <laughs> and they have these rumination thoughts. Okay, So the brain is just spinning and going round, round, round. So how do you cope with that? How do you deal with that? How do you get mental tools to deal with that? And then negative thoughts versus positive thinking. So I think not only founders, but many of us have this, you know, when the shit hits the fan, we have a tendency as human beings as talking shit to ourselves, yeah? So we have this negative crow sitting on, 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 on our shoulder saying, you are crap, you should have done better. Uh, you didn't do your research, you hired the wrong salesperson and so on, yeah? So, and, and that crow, many founders think that that crow is really helpful because it's pushing them. But these constant negative thoughts, you know, they are actually killing your performance. So the founders that are quite, you know, mentally resilient, they have the ability to shut that crow up and get some more positive uh, thinking. And that's also what we train. And then purpose of motivation, very important in regards to mental resilience. People who are very, you know, have a high degree of purpose in what they do are more mentally resilient. Data also shows that. And people who are, have a high degree of inner motivation also have a higher um, mental resilience. And then identity, who they are and sticking to who you are on that journey is also something that we train in this program. And then, of course, social support. Very important. They get social support from each other. It was quite interesting because I, in my uh, Easter holiday, I read about the American army. And for many, many years, they have trained, of course, their, their uh, uh, military people when they went to war physically. But they are also doing mental resilience training. And a lot of the areas oh, that they are training is this. Not that I'm saying that the uh, founders are in war, but it's, of course, the same also for high performance, for sports people, that uh, it's, it's a lot of the same tools that are used 
uh, for people who need to perform under pressure. Yes. Any questions before we mo move on? Yes. Talking about pe uh, uh, personal types. Yes. I mean, it sounds like if you're going to be a very egocentric person in order to cope all this, but on the other hand, you need to be emotionally based to be able to be innovative, mm. to have all these people relations. Yeah. Is it, is it possible to combine all these things? Of course, you say yes. Mm. But it can. Is it, is it some kind of... Are you born with all the um, competences can, or can you learn mm. them? Or is it special types of people mm. that become founders? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. I think it's a very good, very good point because when VCs assess, you know, a founder or, 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 or as Preseed assess a founder, they, they, they assess, you know, the picture right now. Yeah. But, but what, what we are doing in the circles is also working with the potential. And what we know from, from science and from neuroscience is that the brain has neuroplasticity. So we are able to train, especially also the emotional intelligent capabilities. So the more you listen, we can actually see that the listening part of your brain, the more we train empathy, the more we will have empathy. So emotional intelligence, which is what you're talking about, is trainable skills. And emotional intelligence is what many VCs are also assessing their founders on very important founder skills because it's it has very much to do with these areas yeah emotional intelligence knowing who you are what you are feeling being able to manage them because otherwise you don't you are not able to manage other people because you're not able to see feelings in other people and therefore manage them so it starts with yourself and your own mental health and that's another point when you build a company is that you have a quite a large responsibility as a founder because sometimes I get called in as, with the founder team and they say, oh, Cecily, there is a very low degree of trust in our organization. And maybe there are 100 people. And guess what? Guess where that lack of trust is coming from? Where do you think that lack of trust is coming from eventually? Pardon? C-suite, the founder him or herself, yeah? And the way they collaborate in the founder team. So because it's such a small organization, everything you do and all the shit you carry as a founder is getting drilled down, yeah? And the bigger your organization gets, the bigger your problem gets, yeah. So I would like you to do a small mental resilience exercise with me around managing worries and rumination. And so it's just going to be an ultra quick one, yeah? But it's just to give you a, a, a sense of, of how to train mental resilience. So it's, it's a tool to manage worries. Um, and here it's what is called a metacognitive approach. You can Google that if you're interested. It's super an interesting part of psychology, which is, is quite new. But it is um, Professor Adrian Wells. Um, who has started uh, the met metacognitive approach. And the foundation of that is that the mind is self-healing. Yeah, so, so if we do not scratch in the wounds, the mind will, will heal itself. And, and, and what the metacognitive approach says is that um, what's the problem with with, with our, you can say, rumination and worries and so on, is not the thoughts we are having, but the, it's the attention that we bring to our thoughts. Yeah? So it's when we ruminate and worry and threat monitor and do dysfunctional coping, it's because of the CAS, so the cognitive attentional syndrome. So it's how much time we use on those thoughts. And I'm going to explain it also after the, um, the exercise. So what I would like you to do is to, this is a mapping worry tool, and what I would like you to do is to map your worries. So it could be, and then have a discussion with the person that sits next, next to you about it, if you're okay with that, with sharing. 
So I would like you to write, the first one is to write, what is the last time you, uh, you thought about your problems? What was the thir first thought that came into your mind? And we call that a trigger thought. Yeah. So for example, when I did my small startup, my husband, he's also an entrepreneur. So we didn't really have that much money. And we have a house and two kids. And I was so afraid that we would end on the street. My trigger thought had to do with everything about money. So every time I saw a bank sign or I saw something about money, I got very triggered. So that was my trigger thought. You know, we're going to end on the street because no money. So write down your trigger thought. After that, I would like you to write down how do you cope with that? What's your guess? How do you cope with that trigger thought? So what's your strategy? So do you worry and ruminate? Do you begin to think really rational? Do you do a plan? Uh, do you avoid something? Kind of, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And also, how much time do you spend on this thought? And I would like you to take a worry that's, you know, um, reoccurring, that comes to you again and again, that you also maybe know is not very good for you. We all have these worries, reoccurring worries that come, yeah? And then the last one is to write down which cis, cis symptoms do you get when you have this worry. So do you get, do you have anxiety, sadness, tiredness, tenseness? What happens to you when you have these worries? Anybody that want to share a worry? Thank you. Something that Martin just shared with me mm -hmm. um, that I thought was an interesting point because he said that he gets sort of anxieties about not being good enough about a specific thing. So the yeah. crawl that you talked about. Yeah. But he also mentioned that um, yeah. it pushes him to mm -hmm. like find solutions and mm -hmm. work better, which is also what you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, where is the fine balance between sort of double checking on yourself mm -hmm. or being self-destructive? Yeah. So I know that I think that you know when it's blocking you and when it's helping you. Yeah. So when it's blocking you, it's destructive. Yeah, and when, when you are ruminating too much about it, uh, it's becoming more destructive because then you're using cognitive space and time on something that's just rumination and thought, thought spinning, yeah? And if it's ruining your sleep, then it's also, you know, not a very good coping strategy. But it's a good question because, of course, these some of these things also drives us forward. But it's this fine, you know, when it's tipping, and, you know, we are going into this rumination, constant thinking, over-worrying, where it affects our well-being and our performance, yeah? So it's having the the tools to cope with it when it gets too much, yeah? That when makes it sense. turns into a loop. Yes, yeah, well said, yes. My question would be if there are any triggers for noticing when you get into that kind of perfection spiral or mm -hmm. yeah you could call it perfection spiral you could call it something else but there is a point and everybody knows that point where it yes. starts getting self-destructive yes I, I guess so at least yes. but noticing that point mm -hmm. is the is the challenge are there any good advice on noticing that point specifically mm -hmm. it's it's being aware in the moments where you think you have it and then try to notice it so it's building up I awareness. So, and it's building up awareness generally about w how you're feeling. So for example, five, 10 minutes meditation every day builds up an amazing awareness about emotional state and also thoughts. Um, so it's a good tool to build up um, emotional intelligence and mental awareness. And that will help you eventually to know you know, what are your specific triggers? But if you know that you are maybe triggered in this situation, then really, you know, put on what I call your observing self. So kind of see you from the outside if you were hanging in a room, you know, looking down and then try to observe, you know, what's happening with me? What are the emotions I'm having and what, what are they triggered by? Yeah. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm really good at this. Yeah. So an alternative strategy in regards to to CAS is to it's a very simple strategy. 
it's so simple that one is, you know, how can I do that? And that is to decouple your attention. So not, you know, being your observing self, choosing not to use attention on that thought. We are able, so human beings that are normally well-functioning and that do not have a diagnosis in some way have this ability. And this is the heart of the metacognitive approach. And it's a little bit like when your worries come, it's a little bit like thinking, okay, now my worry come, like my worry train come. So do I, you know, do I jump on that worry train? Or do I just, you know, use my attention on something else? Or you can see it as, you know, these uh, sushi things my kids love, yeah? So when that worry comes, do you take it, you know, and really go into the worry and ruminate and worry about it? Or do you just notice it's there? It's okay, it's there. My worry is there. But I choose not to use attention on it. I use my attention on something else. Or you can see it as a mosquito bite. That your worry is a mosquito bite. Do you scratch in it or do you just let it be? Or a chewing gum that's lying in your mouth. You know, a worry that you have. We all have worries, it's normal. But you choose, will I chew on that worry? Will I use attention on it? Or will I not? And that's a mental training. It takes time to train that, but it's possible. And that is a mental resilient strategy to train how to manage worries and rumination, just to give you a little concrete example of that. So thank you, Cecilia Ville, for taking the stage, sharing your insights. Thank you. Mm -hmm.